Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I see people are slowly joining the session, so we will give um, it a minute or two so that everybody can join us and then we will start with today's session. Um, okay, so most of you are already here and uh, a couple attendees uh, still connecting. So I think we'll so slowly start uh, with the session. So um, thank you for joining us today. Uh, hope you all made a nice cup of uh, tea or coffee and are comfortably seated. Before we start, just a few housekeeping rules, infos. Um, so all attendees, are on mute. In case you have any questions, please use the chat box on your right side. We will try to answer them as uh, we go along. Um, and if we skip some, we will answer them during our Q&A session. Um, we hope the connection is okay, that you can uh, see us and hear us well. And uh, this session is uh, recorded and the recording will be shared with you after the webinar. So initially, when we were arranging this webinar, we were deciding we were not sure whether to do it on um, Croatian or English. But as we have a lot of attendees from uh, all over the region, we simply decided to do it in English. 
just to make sure that everybody uh, understands the, the, the content fully. Um, and uh, I do apologize upfront on my uh, bad English accent. And if I maybe mistakenly uh, start mixing English and German, hope that will you know not happen. Uh, but uh, yeah, so I think we can slowly uh, start. Before we start, uh, just a few words about us for those who don't uh, know us that well. We are value add distributor of cloud and on-premise solutions for managed service providers and IT professionals with uh, focus on security, communication, and documentation of IT environments. We cover a wider region, so everything from uh, Austria all the way down to North Macedonia. We have offices in uh, two locations, so uh, St. Florian, Upper Austria, which is really next close next to, to, to Linz, and uh, Zagreb, Croatia. At the moment, we are working with over 300 IT companies to deliver security and uh, protection for both services and solutions to their client environments across uh, the region. In our portfolio, you will find well-known vendors and established brands like Altaro, Enable, and um, Anydesk, but um, also innovative technologies and solutions like LionGuard, KeepNet Labs, Halo PSA, OneClick, and uh, Hornet Security. We offer everything from uh, backup and disaster recovery, phishing awareness and education, um, remote management and professional services automation, email security and uh, continuity, data loss and data exfiltration protection, and as well EDR and PAM technologies and solutions. Today, uh, my colleague Yurica and I are on a mission to give you more insight into EDR solutions, um, what they offer, how they compare to uh, AV products, and ultimately how they compare to each other. Uh, for those who don't know us that well, um, here's a little bit uh, better picture. We do hope that uh, today's session gives you all information you need to choose the best product for your specific needs. Um, I will be in charge for the initial part of the session and my colleague Yuritsa will do a short demo afterwards. Um, when preparing for this session, um, we were really trying to balance uh, you know the, the the informational part and the time because there is of course so much information you know that's i personally think it's valuable to share but i hope we managed to you know find the right balance between those two so um let's get started uh, i'm sure most of you are already familiar with edr products what they stand for and uh, what they offer Anton Chauvin, and I apologize to the gentleman if I pronounce his name wrong, but Anton Chauvin from Gartner uh, originated the term endpoint detection and response, using it to describe a family of new tools focused on visibility and all from prevention to detection for uh, endpoint. EDR solution can be best described as a comprehensive tool that expands antivirus into a whole new realm. Everything modern antivirus can do, EDR takes a step further, uh, providing greater security and, of course, more importantly, peace of mind. These functions include, but are not limited to, uh, monitoring, threat detection, allow listing and deny exclude listing, threat response, and integrations with uh, other cybersecurity tools. EDR centers on uh, protecting endpoints. Uh, given uh, the number of threats that spawn daily, antivirus and other traditional endpoint security products can fall short uh, for managing attacks across large number of endpoints. Um, when we talk about traditional AV, it's uh, typically from a passive standpoint. Uh, AV can only detect and quarantine known threats, those that have been um, previously identified, of course. Many antivirus solutions operate on traditional virus signatures. When a file gets discovered as a malware, it generates a hash that then gets uh, added to a virus uh, signature database. AV programs then scan for file that uh, match a non-virus signature in their database, then quarantine the file. And basically, this is where the problem lies. Uh, antivirus requires regular, uh, regular signature updates. This means that there is often a gap in coverage between a virus, when a virus is actually detected, and when your customer is protected. 
Plus, threats uh, that haven't yet been discovered can operate in the wild before you can um, even get an update. Simply stated, it's a, a way of a reactive uh, approach to protection of uh, endpoints. In contrast, we have, of course, EDR solutions. Uh, EDR is uh, proactive, compromised of uh, monitoring software and uh, endpoint agents. EDR solutions are integrated machine, uh, use integrated machine learning and advanced artificial intelligence to identify suspicious behavior and address them regardless of whether there is a signature or not. Um, instead of relying on a signature, they use process injection to determine in real time whether a process is malicious or not. Many cyber criminals have developed methods, of course, of evading traditional antivirus solutions. Some might uh, develop a malware that changes uh, signature, like polymorphic malwares, um, regularly to avoid matching a known signature in uh, anti antivirus database, while uh, others may use fileless attacks and set up a new admin account on an endpoint with strong privileges. Um, an EDR solution looks for unusual behavior on an endpoint, um, of course, compared to a baseline, then takes uh, actions accordingly. This allows you to meet proactive cyber criminals with, of course, proactive defenses. Here we have uh, listed several different advanced threats, and each of them has its own specific way to evade antivirus products. Um, browser drive uh, by downloads and fileless attacks are worth to mention as they actually execute the payload directly in the working memory of an endpoint, leaving no footprint on the endpoint's, endpoint's drive. And uh, antivirus can't detect something that isn't there. Um, and basically here is where artificial intelligence and behavioral analytics and process injection, injection come into place. Um, an EDR solution uh, uses machine learning to establish a baseline of behavior or a profile for a specific endpoint. After that, it is constantly on the lookout for behavior that strays from this baseline. In order to do that, EDR is constantly checking um, and asking questions like, uh, has, the, has this endpoint performed this functionality or activity before? Does this file or behavior exhibit uh, some unusual patterns? And um, why are secured files being uh, looked at or hit? In order to do that, uh, we have to monitor the activity of the process after the execution. If signature or a definition exists, the AV uh, will block the file. Um, if not, some of them uh, will use, of course, a sandbox or try to scan the code um, as an additional uh, security layer for a zero day protection, but they do not monitor what happens after the file is uh, executed. So this is not 100% bulletproof. And um, as we have known, there are malwares out there that can evade this type of uh, protection. With standard AVs, uh, for example, you have uh, proactive protection, which means that you are basically waiting uh, that new malware strikes somewhere and that uh, AV companies issue new definitions before the malware reaches you, unless it strikes you first and uh, of course you're out of luck. Um, quarantine and kill is still a part of any pre-execution detection and remed uh, remediation, of course, um, regardless of the product. But other protection layers are important as well. We have seen that privilege escalation and uh, lateral movement are uh, among most common techniques used in attacks. And uh, to be able to detect and prevent this type of activities is basically half of the job. EDR solutions go a step further and offer file system uh, and registry rollback functionalities, uh, network isolation, which actually addresses specifically this uh, lateral movement, and complete attack history, which is a crucial, of course, for forensic purposes. This basically means that uh, an EDR product, uh, when configured properly, of course, can, on a detection of a malware or any malicious activity, isolate the endpoint on the network, use the shadow copy or uh, rollback to uh, bring back or let's say roll back any changes done to the endpoint being that that can be you know encrypted files added or change registry items and so on and give you the full report history of the incident itself but um, we focus a lot 
on malware and advanced threats when talking about EDR products. But it's not only malware we have to worry about. There is a big number of threat actors out there, groups like Conti, Black Matter, Dark Side, Revel, and so on, that uh, offer ransomware as a service and other different types of malicious services. These uh, malicious actors use a wide set of tools and techniques to compromise the environment, exfiltrate the data, and delete their presence. Having a definition-based product as a protection against this is not quite um, appropriate. By the way, um, not sure if everybody is on uh, on this call is uh, familiar with this, but um, in early August there was a big data leak in the world of cybercrime, um, and this time, fun fact, it was not uh, a usual data leak which we would expect from a big, you know, uh, enterprise or a company that lost uh, their data or was infiltrated and so on. This time, it came from the other side. Um, a disgruntled affiliate or a person that is uh, associated with the Conti ransomware group publicly leaked a collection of offensive tools and detailed manual describing step-by-step -step instructions for their hired hackers to launch attacks on victims from across the world. Uh, the data leak is actually a gold mine from a threat intelligence perspective and it inspired vendors to create dozens of new complex behavioral queries to identify potential Conti activity. Um, it is actually rumored that the leaker was not happy with the payment he was receiving for compromising networks. Um, yeah, it's you know, a cruel and unfair world we are living in, and it seems there is really no honor among the thieves after all. Uh, but anyway, because of this, he decided to share their whole internal knowledge and tools with the rest of the world. Um, this specific leak has given a security vendors a real, real competitive advantage um, in the field at the moment. However, this is of course certainly not the first time that uh, data leaks have significantly impacted the global uh, cyber threat landscape. Uh, a similar notable event occurred in 2017 from a threat actor known as Equation Group, which is uh, widely believed to be associated with the US National Security Agency or NSA. Um, the leak was caused by a severe break in uh, security policy and the equation group leak released the Eternal Blue and Double Pulsar Zero Day exploits into the wild, um, where of course they were quickly adopted by other cyber criminals and nation state actors, resulting in a major threat which maybe you will be more familiar with um, uh, as WannaCry and Petya. And, uh, here on the slide, you can see the list with just several threats and methods that are out there. Um, so it's important to note that it's not only malware you're up against, it's not only malware we have to worry about when talking about protection. And with that, uh, we are uh, here. That brings us to our, our uh, meter attack evaluations, which uh, test EDR solutions against this type of threats. Um, what Meter did uh, in this case is they have set up the uh, environment, called EDR vendors to implement their protection and emulated the steps that are commonly used by threat actors, in this case, Sar Carbank and FinZ7, to penetrate the environment, uh, exfiltrate and destroy the data and uh, do what these threat actors would normally do in uh, in, in uh, classic uh, situation. And they did it, of course, to, to see how different EDR products stack up to real-world uh, threat scenarios. So a little bit more info about CareBank uh, and FIN7. Uh, CareBank is a threat group that uh, mainly targets banks. It also refers to a malware that uh, it has the same name. Uh, it is sometimes referred to as FIN7, but these appear to be actually two different groups using the same CareBank malware and uh, are therefore tracked separately in this case. FIN7 is a financially motivated threat group that has primarily targeted the US retail, restaurant, and hospitality sector since mid 2015. They often use point of sale malware, and a portion of FIN7 uh, was run out of a front company called Combi Security. Uh, these groups carry out a firm uh, reputation of utilizing innovative threat craft. So, you can say that efficient espionage and stealth are the forefront of these strategies as they often rely heavily on scripting, obfuscation, hiding in a plain sight, and fully exploiting the user behind the machine while pillaging the environment. They are also leveraging 
a unique spectrum of operational utilities spanning both uh, uh, sophisticated malware as well as legitimate legitimate i'm sorry administration tools capable of interacting with various platforms like uh, windows linux um, including point of sale specific of course technologies so a few words about uh, scenarios uh, so we had of course carbank scenario uh, and we had pin uh, seven scenario uh, carbon scenario uh, begins with a legitimate user executing a malicious payload delivered via spear phishing attacks targeting financial institutions following initial compromise carbank expands access to their uh, hosts through privilege escalation credential access and lateral movement with the goal of compromising money processing services, automated teller machines and financial accounts. As carbon compromises potentially valuable targets, they establish resistance so that they can learn the financial organization's internal procedures and technology, of course. Using this information, carbon transfers uh, funds to bank accounts under their control, completing their missions, basically. And the uh, FIN7 scenario uh, emulates uh, FIN7 targeting a hotel manager network to gain access to credit card information. The scenario begins with FIN7 achieving initial access to the network after unwitting user executes a malicious LNK file. Uh, FIN7 then uh, pivots to privilege IT administrative workstation. From this system, um, they Kilo credentials needed to access an accounting workstation, uh, then pivots to accounting workstation, establishes persistence, and deploys malware to scrape credit card information from process memory. Uh, to give you more visual experience uh, and overview of these scenarios, I have also prepared a um, attack navigator, which actually, maybe, as I say, from visual perspective, Gives you a better picture of actually what's happening so uh, as we see across the whole threat landscape we have several you know phases we have everything from initial access execution to you know, establishing a persistence um, then you know credential access uh, lateral movement all the way down to impact itself which would be basically uh taking the data and you know uh, messing with the system uh, encrypting the files or deleting them and of course deleting their pres uh, presence um just to give you more info about uh, what we are looking at uh, so um we have carbank steps are marked with blue color fin7 steps are marked with red and yellow steps are basically uh the steps that have both scenarios executed so as we can see, the initial access was uh, established by uh, spear phishing attachment, but we also have some other well-known uh, techniques to establish initial access into a customer's environment, which would be a drive-by uh, compromise or a wireless attacks, uh, exploding public-facing applications, uh, spear phishing links, and so on. Then once the initial access is established, uh, um, you can do several execution techniques. In this case, we have a command, command line interface or you know, execution through APIs, PowerShell, and so on. Uh, once uh, that is achieved, uh, uh, a threat actor is trying to establish a persistence within the system and uh, after that, uh, escalate their privileges. And as we already mentioned, privilege escalation and lateral movement are among the most common techniques uh, that are executed with uh, ransomware malware attacks or any other types of attacks so having uh, products that can you know prevent lateral movement which would be for example edr or privilege escalation which would be some sort of um, technology is a um, really really a uh, step in a good direction uh, once uh, the threat actors establish a uh, privilege escalation uh they try to evade the defenses the existing defenses they try to uh penetrate uh, more credentials by brute force techniques or credential dumping then when they have done that successfully they try to discover the rest of the system so what's out there what can we use what can we you know compromise um then of course it's a time for a lateral movement across the network uh and collection and exfiltration of details 
and basically this is what we are up against this is what's out there in the real world what we are actually defending customer environments uh, against so having um let's say outdated technologies or just uh, simple antivirus products simply doesn't uh, quite help here so back to our presentation just a moment few words about the uh, environment itself that was uh, used in this case uh, for this evaluation. So the evaluations were performed in uh, Microsoft Azure Cloud. Each vendor was provided with two identical environments consisting of eight hosts on which they have installed their client um, software. These two environments were used for the detection only and protection tests, of course. The vendors also had the uh, option of installing software, uh, server software onto a virtual machine, VM, already in the environment or importing a VM uh, if necessary, of course. By default, the Azure VMs were standard B4MS, each with uh, four CPUs, vCPUs, and 60 gigabytes of uh, memory. Each vendor had a full and complete administrative access to the hosts instanced for them. Um, VPN access uh, was enabled uh, for connectivity to the environment and passwords were shared via out-of-band methods. So there was one VPN server per environment and vendors then used RDP or SSH uh, elsewhere within the environment. Hosts were reachable only within the VPN and they did not have uh, any public IP addresses assigned to them via Azure, but they were able to access the internet. Um, it is also worth to mention that the, there were two stages in testing. So after the first stage, each vendor was given a chance to tweak and expand their con configuration in order to uh, improve their initial uh, results. So yeah, how did they do? Here we can see uh, the results overview. The chart consists of two accesses. First one is uh, missed detections and the other is analytic detection coverage. On the right side, we have vendors with the least missed de de detections. And on the upper side, we have vendors with the most analytic detection coverage. So just to clarify this to a little bit, um, missed detections represent any activity or an malicious activity that was missed by the vendor. So it shows that the MIT evaluation team did not see enough evidence to provide the minimal visibility of uh, the threat. And uh, analytic detection coverage uh, described, is described, um, uh, let's say, as a high quality detection due to the detail of uh, info that it uncovers. This uncovers the intent of the attack and what specific techniques would the attacker intends to use to achieve this. Here we can um, see, for example, that Sentinel-1 has the best results of the specific test. Uh, it has scored zero missed detections, meaning they uncovered all sub-steps performed by the attackers and no other vendors actually achieved this uh, result of, of zero misses. Um, and they have highest analytic detection coverage. That uh, means you know that they performed better than any other vendor on this uh, test. Actually, their uh, analytic coverage was above 90%, meaning around 100, uh, 159 from 174 um, uh, techniques. A uh, little bit to the left, we have a few vendors that are also really there up to the top. So we have Checkpoint, we have Palo Alto, Trend Micro. Uh, they performed really good. We have a few vendors that are in the gold middle. You know, we have FireEye, uh, Silence, McAfee, uh, Carbon Black, and so on. And then we have all the way to the left, a few vendors that uh, did not perform so well on these specific tests. To give you more um, details, here is basically the same uh, results we have seen on a previous image, but giving a specific stats around the metrics for each uh, vendor. So we have uh, the visibility, which means the percentage of the steps taken by the uh, adversary that had been detected by, by the antivirus or EDR product. So here we can see that uh, Sentinel-1 has uh, 174 detections from 174 uh, test sub-steps over two days of testing, so basically 100%, and the only vendor to deliver 100% visibility with zero missed detections. Right under, we have several other vendors like Palo Alto, 10 Micro, Checkpoint, um, Simantech, and so on. 
uh, that are still above this 90% uh, uh, level, let's say. I mean, still, we are talking about uh, 174 different, you know, threats, techniques that were used. So meaning um, if you detected, uh, let's say 91%, so that means that 9% of them evaded your tool, which would mean from 174, um, around uh, yeah, 16, 15 uh, of threats still passed the, 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 the security uh, defenses, which could be good, maybe not so good. Yeah, it depends how you look at the results. But as we go a little bit uh, lower, we see other vendors like F-Secure, you know, McAfee, Asset, Silence, uh, FireEye, Sophos, that um, had actually surprising uh, results. Um, so on to the next slide. Uh, here we can see uh, another image that shows total analytic detection coverage by the vendor and the number of missed detections. Just to clarify this a little bit. So Mitre has divided uh, detections into telemetry coverage and analytic coverage detection. Telemetry coverage means that uh, threat was detected and prevented, but offered minimal insight into the threat and um, analytic coverage is any detection that provides exact context, context <coughs> I apologize, for a specific technique incident. So meaning, you know, the type of incident, general info or tactic techniques. This would be highly valuable data for forensic analysis of the threat incident um, itself. So total visibility is actual combination of these two coverage types. In case of Sentinel-1, for example, we can see that Sentinel-1 has a highest analytic coverage detection of 159 techniques, or let's say incidents from total of 174 that were executed. Uh, they have zero missed detections, which would mean that they have total 15 telemetry coverage detections, uh, giving them altogether 100% visibility of the attack. And after that, we have uh, several other vendors that are, you know, relatively close to this. They have uh, really good analytic coverage uh, detection. So meaning, you know, checkpoint, big defender. Um, they are all really close to this 159 level of what Sentinel-1 has achieved. But on the other side, they have also several uh, missed detections, which is, um, yeah, also maybe not so uh, amazing. But as we said, the tests were, you know, uh, done in two rounds. Just a moment. Um, so we also have delayed detections. <clears throat> uh, a delay is uh, when a detection is not immediate because some other processing needs to happen. So whether it's a solution that needs to send data to sandbox system or human forensics to get a second opinion, or in this case, there were a need for a change in configurations. As we mentioned earlier, the tests were made in two rounds, and the second one, uh, uh, in the second one, vendors were given chance to additionally tweak their configuration to have a better detection. So, these tweaks and changes, <coughs> uh, these tweaks and changes can be uh, can mean you know several things. So, whether there was need to uh, make a change to a data source, meaning, you know, change a, a sensor, uh, how the sensor functions, so you can collect uh, new information by the sensor, um, or, you know, change in detection logic, so changes made to data processing logic, or changes made to a user interface. So these are the changes that, you know, this would mean bas basically that maybe the, the product has collected the data, but was not presented in a proper way by the, the, the solution. So, um, for example, Sentinel-1 uh, detects threats in uh, real time uh, without any delays. So they actually had 100% uh, of detection without zero delays. Then we see some other vendors actually um, were really successful, like, you know, Symantec and CrowdStrike. They changed the configuration. We are not having the, the, the how to say, exact information what from these three changes they made. Was it uh, changes to a data source or to a detection logic or to use an interface? But whatever they did uh, enabled them to detect 40 more threats. CrowdStrike also did uh, really good changes and uh, that gave them opportunity to detect more threats. Uh, 
but we hope of course you know that after these evaluations the the vendors uh, implement these changes into their products so it keeps this level of protection not only for the test purposes so um, what did actually Sentinel-1 detect? Uh, here we can see all the phases, you know, steps, activities, and text syncs. Sentinel-1 has detected. The yellow color represents telemetry. <coughs> I apologize. Um, dark green, blue, uh, or even let's say turkeys, perhaps general information. And dark green is a tactic. That has been applied and light green uh the technique I'm, i would say that this is not maybe you know, the, the best way to present the details especially when these colors are so similar so it's really hard to differentiate them on the graphs but what we can see from both scenarios that uh, sentinel one had uh, full coverage uh, of uh, all steps of the incident itself and uh, threats that were executed uh, we see that you know for each step you can see the telemetry um which is really important to have for some steps a general info for some some steps already you know some information about the taxi tactics um and for all of the steps uh of course really valuable information about techniques that were used to execute the uh, attack with that being said um i think i can you know give you uh to my colleague Yuritsa, who will do a short demo and maybe, you know, give us more insight into how Sentinel-1 uh, detects and uh, protects uh, end user systems. Just a moment, Yuritsa, I will make you a presenter. Okay, I think you can try to share your screen with us. Okay, uh, you should be able to see my screen now. Yep. I can confirm we see your screen, so you can uh, proceed. So this what you see is basically a dashboard in Sentinel-1 console. Uh, you can see some info as unresolved threats in the last 30 days, infected uh, endpoints, agent status, and threats by detection engine. This is all uh, configurable, and you can add the widgets, widgets or remove them. Uh, the next what I want to show you, uh, these are the policies. So the policies are uh, basically a set of mitigation settings and uh, you can uh, configure the settings and define behavior or uh, account level, site level or group level. Just a minute, okay. We will explain uh, the basic mode options. You have detect mode and protect mode. Uh, detect mode, of course, only sends alerts and detects the threats, and protect uh, does the remediation and rollback. Uh, for the start, it is recommended that you set both on detect uh, while uh, your system is still learning. Then you can uh, later choose for suspicious threats to, example, detect uh, only, and for malicious threats, uh, you set it to protect level. Uh, the and Sentinel-1 uses different engines for malware and uh, malicious threats uh, detection and remediation. So you have reputation, but uh, this is not uh, the base of the operation. So you can use uh, detection for, from, uh, you know, from uh, some... Uh, a Sentinel-1 cloud, but it, it is not the way it usually does. Uh, you have basic uh, two set of uh, uh, engines. So first is pre-execution that includes static AI and static AI is suspicious. And the second is the rest that uh, acts uh, on the post-execution doing process injection. So static AI works when starting uh, when you write a file. So he detects uh, the write a file and he blocks uh, or he kills and quarantines the malicious threat. Uh, same is for static AI for suspicious files. Uh, behavior AI is an advanced detection system based on learning and takes the place in the real time. 
EDR also detects uh, drive-by downloads. Uh, you have documents and, and scripts, so it's focused on various types on uh, documents and scripts. Uh, then you have lateral movement that detects attacks uh, triggered from remote devices. Uh, you have uh, anti-exploitation uh, fileless attacks, prevents exploitation of security vulnerabilities, example related to the web and command line. Uh, you can also see that uh, you have an option of application control uh, considering containers ensures the image consistency by running the executables from original container that run in the container. Uh, the next is uh, detecting interactive threat, also based on part of behavioral IE. Uh, by default, IDS is disabled, but you can uh, use it uh, and it focuses on insider threats, protects the system from malicious commands, uh, for example, entered in command line or in PowerShell. Uh, the next, uh, what we want to show you is basically a protection level. So you can choose whether to kill and quarantine, remediate, fix the things, or roll back. Uh, roll back is interesting uh, from the point that it uh, uses uh, the VSS shadow copies, and uh, the default interval is uh, four hours. You can also change it. Uh, the shadow copies are uh, protected and encrypted, so the viruses or any other malicious threats uh, don't have access to them and cannot uh, tamper with them. Uh, the next thing uh, that is important is containment. So you have uh, autoimmune for verified threats, uh, but the interesting option is disconnect from network uh, that can be used uh, to contain the threat on the said uh, endpoint and only maintain uh, communication with uh, Sentinel-1 console. Uh, you have also agent notification on suspicious uh, alerts and you can also turn out auto decommission after the days of offline, you define uh, how many days do you want. The next two options, can you engines and anti-temper are very important. Uh, because uh, Sentinel-1 uh, does not uh, do all the scanning and intensive disk scans. So when you select these options, it runs full disk scan after the installation. And then later it doesn't run it unless you, of course, select it. Anti-temper is for not allowing malware or even the users to manipulate, uninstall, or in any way disable the agent. If you really need to uh, uninstall the agent, then it is possible by sending the code uh, with the approval, of course, of the admin that is in charge of uh, Sentinel-1 console. Uh, you have, uh, as I said, VSS snapshots, so you can set uh, Windows uh, agents to keep VSS snapshot in order to do uh, the rollback. Uh, the, this is not, of course, a replacement for a backup, and the retentions is default 30 days. Uh, what I want to uh, tell you more, it is enabling a remote shell uh, that uh, allows you to control device directly, log in practically to the device, and uh, so you can uh, access manage endpoints directly from the console uh, to investigate attacks, understand attack content, and remediate breaches by troubleshooting and user issues. Uh, the next, what I want to show you is exclusions. So you can define some exclusions depending of uh, maybe if there are false uh, detections or maybe you want to pass some uh, apl uh, application that is not malware, but it's not used in a business environment. Also, you have the option of network control where you can use uh, uh, your rules to define firewall uh, allow or block rules and you have device control uh, that is used to control access to Bluetooth and USB devices. Next what I want to show you is activity log. So in the activity log you can see different threads and you have you can see what actually happened and was it successfully, for example, remediated. 
And for the details, you go to incidents. So when we open the incidents, this is, for example, from uh, recently one uh, endpoint. It's uh, for the testing purposes, but you can see information, uh, was it malicious or not? You can see the name of the process, uh, the endpoint that was affected, and you can see the detected engine. Uh, for example, this one was uh, detected by on-right static eye. This was from Sentinel Cloud. And this one was from example for reputation. And of course, you have the classification. If you click on one of these, we get more information about it, about this, uh, the threat and what actually was detected and what happened. As you see, this was classified as the ransomware. And if you click on the Explore tab, you can see more information about it, about the processes that was affected. So if we click here, it uh, actually says uh, there were three processes uh, involved. And you can see that there were three registry entries. So you have see, uh, you can see all the details. And uh, you can see what happened, like file creation, file modification. Uh, you see all the professors, uh, processes involved here. So it's really a uh, detailed, uh, detailed uh, information. Uh, of course, it depends on the malware. Sometimes you will see more of this here and more of processes involved. Uh, what has been done, it has been done a rollback and the rollback uh, has been done successful. And as you can see, it was done in less than five seconds. So this is actually the timeline, what happened and how the mitigation and uh, rollback was done. Uh, I want, before we turn back, I want to say a few more things. Uh, the Sentinel-1 is not hard on the resources. Uh, the agent takes uh, one to 10% of uh, maximum uh, CPU resources and it takes about 130 megabytes on RAM. Uh, when you set uh, VSSs, it usually it takes one to 2% of hard drive space, maximal uh, by 10. And uh, if you want uh, to define uh, some, uh, uh, prevent large positives and you have older legacy, legacy applications, it is recommended, as I said, to first use detect mode only and mark those applications as benign. So this is basically everything from uh, my standpoint. So if you want uh, to take again in charge. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, sure, just please uh, let me make myself a presenter again. Great. Um, can you confirm? Do you see my window? Not yet. Yeah. Huh? Yeah, I see, see it. Okay. Perfect. So, um, thank you for the demo, Yuritsa. Uh, we have some questions, but uh, we can, you know, go through them uh, at the end. Let me just see what uh, do we have uh, from the slide perspective. So, yeah, I mean, from my side, I just wanted to uh tell that basically sentinel one we have it as a part of uh, enable product family in our portfolio so meaning you know you get it as a part of uh, rmm or in central product it is licensed per agent uh, per month uh, per device there is a specific security promo that could be interesting to to everyone on the call so basically technically there are two promos so when we're talking about security promo um Enable offers uh, um, to everybody who actually gets RMM for a minimum 100 agents <clears throat> that they get uh, 600 euros of bonus security credit. Technically, this would mean that uh, if you, for example, get a remote management and monitoring platform um, with 100 agents, you get around, let's say, 200 uh, licenses for EDR for free for next 12 months um, and after these 12 months you can either you know cancel or you know end 
your usage of these EDRs or you know continue but if you continue you pay uh, standard pricing which is also how to say negotiable uh, before at the start if you for example you know want to activate RMM we can um, advance set up the pricing for EDR for uh, the year after <clears throat> these 12 months um, so if you want to do a, a demo or a trial uh, please reach out to us via email here is our email uh, you can also find more details about the products on our website the other promo uh, that uh, I wanted to mention that actually can be combined with this so if uh, somebody is using a competitive RMM uh, so remote management and monitoring product like you know uh, Ninja Kaseya or something like that um, uh, they can get uh, enable RMM for the same price of what they are paying at the moment and at, on top of this actually you can also get this uh, security bonus credit uh, which of course depends on uh, your current uh, costs of RMM. So, for example, if you have I don't know monthly invoice of four or five hundred euros, this would mean that you can actually get eight hundred or thousand euros of bonus security credit. It doubles uh, uh, based on your uh, initial costs. So, um, additionally, what's also um, we have, you know, vendors. Uh, we, we we actually hope vendors have learned something from these uh, evaluations that we share with you um, and that they will improve their respective products uh, but uh, we will know soon the next evaluation is on the way and we can't wait to see of course the results um, we will keep you informed about this um, as always and i think with that we're basically uh, at our q a sessions uh, so let me check quickly the question pane i saw that something was uh, coming um so yeah uh, yurita i think you already offered this uh, i'm sorry answered this but uh, there is a question uh, uh, what is the footprint of an agent so basically what what kind of impact has an agent uh, to to environment can you please just you know say one more time yeah, so the agent is minimally affecting the environment. It uses one to two percent of CPU and about 130 megabytes of RAM. Okay. And of course, it doesn't perform like classic antiviruses uh, intensive disk scans. Only the first time if you choose it. Okay. Um, so there is another one. Uh, can you? change uh, the retention policy for I'm guessing VSS? Yes, the default is 30 days and uh, you can change it and you can also change the four hours interval that is done uh, from from the system. Okay, um, uh, there is a pricing question, I think this is on my side, so price per endpoint so starting price per endpoint is two euros 99 cents so that's from zero to i don't know 100 or 200 i'm quite sure but the starting price is two euros 99 cents um so let me check if something's new Okay, another question, uh, it's for my side uh, on a pricing note. Is there a minimum package? Uh, well, no, no uh, basically no. Um, with uh, EDR, no, actually, I'm sorry. Uh, there is a minimum of 10, that's the minimum. But uh, there was some saying that we can even go as low as five. So I will check it up just to be sure and uh, send you the information afterwards. So it's either five or 10 is the minimum amount of EDR agents. Uh, okay, so I see that something is coming, just uh, please give me a moment that the uh, question comes. So the 
it's also uh, on my side. So basically, um, is there any minimum commitment? So there are no minimum commitments. So you can activate your EDR um, without any one year, two year, three year minimum commitments. And uh, in case you don't want to continue using it, you can of course, you know, discontinue or just uh, continue. So you're not limited. So just give me a moment. There is uh, another question. I have to expand my question. Um, this is an MSP model. Uh, actually, uh, it's licensed uh, per device per month. So basically, as with other enabled products, you get uh, your invoices on monthly basis. So you don't have to buy for a year, or, you know, two years or how much in, in advance. You basically pay, pay per usage. Let me just please check if I missed a question, just to be sure we answered all. We are a little bit over, you know, one hour. Uh, Mark, so I don't see any questions coming at the moment. Um, but um, so I want to thank you all for joining us today. Um, we are at your disposal for any questions you may have uh, or information you might need via phone or email. Please use our contact details to reach us. Um, I will stay a few more minutes here just in case we get uh, other questions but um, I wish you all a nice afternoon uh, hope you enjoyed the, today's session and see you all on our next session so bye everyone bye